Hi everyone, our next speaker is Heather. She leads the Java community as the director, a director of the JCP program standardization efforts at Oracle. She's a leader of the global community driven adoption user group programs, and she drives effort to transform the community and broadening participation and diversity in the community. Heather is passionate about Java women in technology and developer communities serving as an international speaker and community organizer for developer hack days around the world. Heather enjoys speaking at conferences such as Wonder Woman Tech, OSCON, DevOps, Java Zone, and the Java One. All right, everyone. So please let's welcome Heather Vancouver. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Today I'm going to give you an overview of how to get involved with the Java community. But as um, we just talked about, I've been involved with the Java community for quite some time and there have been lots of changes over the years. But one thing remains the same and that, that is that Java continues to be um, one of the number one programming languages in the world. Looking at whichever index you choose, it's um, at the it continues to be at the top of the list. And we've had a growing number of developers all over the world with a focus um, for the platform currently in the cloud connective environment. I gave you a few stats on the number of uh, cloud connected virtual Java machines, 30 billion around the world. And while, while a lot of things have changed in the Java community, some of the things that have started since the beginning when I started working in and with the Java community 20 years ago, many of the things remain the, the same. And you can look at those and think about those as the Java philosophies. Um, and that continues to be the focus. And um, one of the primary things um, that I ensure continues in my role as director and chairperson of the Java Community Process Program through the JCP. We ensure the completeness, quality, and security of the platform and also look at the ways that we can innovate. And most importantly, and what I think um, is the key to Java's success, bring in um, developer feedback and create an active ecosystem around the technology while ensuring compatibility at the same time. And that really is um, the key principle of why the JCP exists and why Java continues to be successful. So this year we are celebrating 25 years of Java and the, the theme for that is our world moved by Java. And what we're looking to do is continue to see Java be successful in the next two decades to come at least. Uh, so I'll share with you a five minute overview of what is the JCP because in my role, um, when I visit Java developers around the world now virtually in 2020, um, many developers don't realize how Java is, is actually evolved and how it's governed. So I think it's important thing for you to realize and maybe see a look what makes Java so unique in how it's developed. And it's organized um, with uh, this structure in mind, which is uh, I'm the chairperson. So you can see in this chart, then I have um, an executive committee um, that serves like a board of directors for the organization. And that um, executive committee is elected every year by our membership. We just finished our elections in November. We have those every year. And then I have a small staff that helps me to support and administer the program. And um, we have open memberships. So developers, companies, open source organizations, Java user groups, individuals can become members. Um, members of the JCP can lead projects. Um, we call our projects JSRs and the leaders are called specification leads. And then members can nominate themselves to serve on expert groups of JSRs. And we also now have contributors for JSRs. And then um, general membership helps to give us feedback. But there's also opportunities for um, the Java developer community at large to give feedback, whether you're a member of the JCP or not. So I'll share with you a little bit about how you can do that. Um, so I mentioned our projects are called JSRs. Um, a JSR is a term most developers have heard of, but you might not necessarily know where it comes from. So projects within the JCP are called JSRs. So that's a Java specification request, and it's a single version of a Java specification. And every JSR has not just a specification, even though it's called a Java specification request, it also has the code, that's the reference implementation, 
and a test suite. So this is how that's um, organized and how that works to enable the ecosystem. So these three deliverables of every JSR work together to enable um, an ecosystem of developer choice, as well as compa that compatibility that we talked about and completeness uh, in and quality in the technology. So you have a specification. Um, that's um, a, a reason why there's so much great um, documentation for Java. We require a full specification that tells you how to build an implementation. The reference implementation is um, code that conforms to that specification, but then we also have the technology compatibility kit. That's the TCK. So that means that independent implementers can take the TCK and take the specification, build their own independent implementation, run it against the TCK and have a compatible implementation. And that's what creates that ecosystem of developer choice and implementations of a specification. So those three developer um, deliverables of the JCP um, work together to ensure a strong compatibility, but also um, a wide variety of choice for developers. So every project developed through the JCP is a JSR, follows the JSR lifecycle, is voted on by the executive committee, and then our members can serve as um, leads, expert group members, and contributors on that JSR. And it is an international effort um, taking place all over the world. Um, I'm fortunate that I've had the opportunity to visit um, developers in every region shown. And I'm also pleased to say that our membership has expanded and grown over the last 20 years where it used, we, when we started out with the JCP, it was primarily corporations contributing and participating in the program, but we've grown to have also nonprofit and open source groups, as well as Java user groups. And most importantly, individual developers, I say most importantly, because that's now our biggest section of membership, individual developers. So it's Java developers who are passionate about the technology that they use every day. And I asked them, when I started to see this big increase in ind individuals joining the JCP, I, I took an a informal survey of our membership, individual members, and asked why. And I think they really boiled down to these two main reasons. And so I pulled a couple of the quotes that were some of my favorites. One, um, really helping to uh, cement uh, your position as a leader in the community. So seeing what's coming first and being seen as an expert, both within your community as well as in your um, employment and your job. And then joining the JCP is like being a Java citizen, also one of my favorites. So um, as a JCP member, you get to vote in the executive committee elections um, and also you can participate in the project. So this is a picture of our executive committee, um, our last face-to-face -face meeting, which was in September last year in San Francisco at the Twitter headquarters. So what's nice about our membership is that you also have that balance in terms of um, the, the memberships elected by our JCP membership of the executive for the executive committee seats, but you see a nice balance in terms of companies, open source groups, Java user groups, and individual developers within the EC as well. So it has that nice representation of representing all of our different membership um, categories. And we also continue to maintain that we need not just open source, um, but also, um, open standards. So I have a, a comment in the chat that you can't see my slides anymore. So I'm going to stop the, the stop the sharing and go back to sharing again. Okay, you can see my slides now. Okay, that's perfect. Um, so my last my last slide I was showing you was. I'll show you just the three things that work together because I think that's a nice visual, and then I'll go back to where I was in what I was saying. So JSR is developed through the JCP. You've got the spec, the reference implementation, and the TCK. Those three things work together. So that's really the heart of the JCP. And then um, just visually so you can see the structure of the organization, how it works. I think that also helps um, developers to understand how, JC, how Java technology is um, overseen. So the structure of the organization. I talked about the JSRs, how it works, three things working together. And then I was gonna move on to talking about the main projects that are being developed through the JCP at this time, which 
is the Java platform, Java SE. So Java SE, um, is every version of Java SE is um, developed as a JSR in the JCP. Underneath the JSR, there's a collection of Java enhancement proposals, which are developed in OpenJDK. So the JCP and OpenJDK work together. Um, the reference implementations of the Java platform are developed collaboratively and released under open source license. So um, the um, a reference implementation and is a made up of JEPS developed in OpenJDK and then the JEPS feed up into a JSR that um, is ratified by the JCP executive committee before it can be used in production in um, final shipping products or any um, developers can use it um, in a um, project that's gonna be released to their customers. But of course we have early access builds that can be used and tested before um, the projects are um, released and available to the public. And I'm explaining to you how you can get involved in that way by, by getting ready and using early access builds. So right now, um, we're at the last major release of the Java SE platform is Java 15. When we released Java 9 back in 2017, we introduced modularity with Project Jigsaw and that also enabled us to move to a faster release cadence. So when I talked about um, innovation and um, bringing in new features for developers, that's a key part of it. And continue to see the success of Java is continuing to bring in that younger generation of developers that are used to in most other technologies they use a faster release cadence. So we moved to a six month release cadence um, versus a three to four year release cadence that Java had been operating under for the last prior to 2017. So since um, Java 9, we've had a new release of Java every six months. So the last major release of Java just came out in September 2020, that's Java 15. So this is the release that you can now use currently in production. It's available for general um, available use. Um, and it was um, a collection of a variety of different Java enhancement proposals. So like I talked about um, how it's organized, here I have a snapshot of the project in OpenJDK, JDK 15. Um, it was a JSR developed as JSR 390 within the JCP. And then there's a collection of features or JEPs um, organized within OpenJDK that made up that Java 15 release. So, Lots of cool features that come out now um, every six months, rather than having to wait three to four years and have a big um, release to digest, um, developers can now take advantage of a, of a smaller, more manageable release cadence of every six months, which makes it easier to see what features and functionality are going into the platform, but also makes it easier to migrate your applications. Once you get past Java 9, you can get on a release schedule that's a little bit more in keeping with the rest of the software development lifecycle of the projects you're typically might be working on. So we're already working on Java 16. Actually, the JSR for Java 17 will probably be coming out next week. Um, but the release of Java 16 is planned for March of 2021. However, there are the early access builds that are available now. So every approximately every two weeks, there's an early access build. And what that means is anyone can um, take that early access build, download it, and uh, test your applications against the early access build of the next release to see what what changes or dependency dependencies are there in migrating your applications to the next release. So um, there's a similar page like I showed you for 15 available now for JDK 16 and that shows you the schedule as well as the features that are targeted to be included in that release. So of course, it, there is already a JSR for JDK 16 in the JCP, it's JSR 391. And um, there are several things targeted to be a part of that. The executive committee still needs to um, approve that JSR before it can be released in March of 2021. And you can go ahead and download those early access builds now. I think one of the things to note here, some interesting things that are coming are of course the migration um, to GitHub, um, which is very cool. That's been in the making for a while. Um, quite some time, but targeted to be part of the 16 release and also um, out coming out of Project Amber Records. Um, so that's a new and exciting feature that uh, should be available in March of 2021. 
So it used to be we had these um, major features, correct? Um, every Java release would pick one of these um, major features that was gonna be worked on and then the next release of Java would wait until that feature was ready. We still have these projects, but how it works now is um, little pieces of each of these projects can come out um, and be targeted for a platform release. So rather than having to um, implement the entire project, you might see little parts of these projects coming out as JEPs and targeted for platform releases. So these are some of the key projects being worked on within OpenJDK right now. And I'll give you just a little bit of a highlight of some of these um, because you also have the opportunity to follow the work of these projects. In addition to, to following the numbered platform releases, you can check out some of these projects being developed in OpenJDK. And they map to some of the priorities and investments um, in the Java platform in the near future. And those focus on security, of course, continuing that security, but also improving productivity and continuing to ensure compatibility, look at increasing density, improving startup time, improving predictability and simplifying serviceability and profiling. And then the projects um, in parentheses would map to some of those priorities. So I have about 10 minutes left. I'll take some questions at the end in the chat, um, but I'm gonna quickly highlight these and you can follow up in OpenJDK for any of these projects. All of these projects have wiki pages and issue trackers and um, downloads um, that you can look at and as well as mailing lists. So Project Valhalla is looking at value types. Um, this is one that's particularly exciting um, for developers and some things are getting close to coming out of Project Valhalla, looking at object data layout and value types. Next, um, Project Portola. So I mentioned in the beginning that um, we're committed to having Java remain the first choice for deployments in the cloud. So obviously Java in a world of containers is important and key here looking at um, some of these aspects as happening in Project Portola. We have Project ZGC, which is a scalable low latency garbage collector and many things um, coming out of this project already that have been integrated into releases currently that are available now up through um, Java 15. Project Panama um, looks at um, specific use cases around big data and machine learning. Obviously there's a great opportunity for Java here. So within Project Panama, they're looking at a simple safe replacement for JNI um, to help Java operate um, in an improved way natively. So that's happening in Project Panama. We also have Project Loom. So um, this will be an update to the concurrency model um, with the big idea being taking millions of fibers and spawning them into a single JVM instance. And the last project I'll highlight is Project Amber. So a lot of the smaller language improvements that you've seen um, from Java 10 to Java 15 and more coming out in 16 and beyond uh, are coming out of Project Amber. So things like switch expressions, pattern matching and records are coming out of Project Amber. And I mentioned downloading early access builds. So you can do that. Where you go to do that is jdk.java.net. When you go there, you can get the latest re uh, release of Java that's ready to use in production. So for now, that's JDK 15. You can also get early access builds of JDK 16 and a 17 build start. Those will be available here, which will be available soon. Uh, 17 builds will be start coming out soon. And then also some of the OpenJDK projects have their own um, project specific builds. So like Valhalla, Loom, Panama have their own builds um, that you can download from jdk.java.net. And another great place to get news about OpenJDK is following OpenJDK on Twitter. And if you wanted to, you can, um, in addition to, I mentioned how you can become a member of the JCP, you can also become a contributor to the OpenJDK um, by going to openjdk.java.net. So um, the next part of my presentation, I'm gonna highlight a little bit about some of the changes that we've had to make in the JCP organization um, to keep up with the needs of the developer community. And then also some quick tips on how to get involved and participate. So obviously we have had to make a few changes to keep up with the changing pace of Java de uh, software development. and. Um, the first one that we ad addressed was transparency. So as I mentioned, the things that I just talked about are all available and open to the public. And we've also resized our executive committee to um, be have a specific focus on the Java SE platform. 
And we looked at how we can enable JSRs to move faster. So like we talked about, um, the release cycle used to be multiple years. It's now gone down to six months. So we had to make some changes in how JSRs can operate under the JCP. And then also look at how we can enable broader participation from the community. So we, we had a big project of looking at how can we eliminate barriers to participation. And what it came down to was, um, Membership shouldn't be one size fits all. We should have different levels of membership for different ways that people wanna participate. So we currently have three types of membership, associate members for individuals. As I mentioned, that's our largest portion of our membership. Also partner members for Java user groups. And then we continue to have the full members um, primarily made up of corporations, but we also have some individuals, for example, um, self-employed individuals and professors that can serve as full members. And then of course, um, we streamlined the JSR development cycle to be more um, in keeping with a faster developer cadence, as well as more in keeping with that open source continuous delivery style of software development. So um, we've, we've implemented all these changes now, effective 2020, um, with the completion of the um, executive committee elections last month in November. And we continue to talk about th these things within the executive committee. And that is all public on jcp.org if you wanted to follow along in those discussions. Um, some of the things that we've been talking about in 2020 focus around also education. So, and le that's looking at the next generation of developers. How can we continue to ensure that we um, attract younger and more junior developers to the Java platform? And we think um, bridging the gap um, through working with the educational community is a great way to do that. So that's some of the discussions that we're having now um, within the executive committee. And um, we can, we're highlighting and offering partnerships with Oracle University for certifications um, with a 25% off promotion to um, move towards training and certification, but also for younger developers offering them a free training course, which is called the Java Explorer course, um, which is a great introduction to Java. Maybe if you hadn't learned um, Java in university or if you wanna add Java as a skill to your toolbox. Um, but then while students are still in university, also looking at how we can partner with Oracle Academy, which has a robust set of resources available in multiple languages. So um, partnering with them and also partnering with the community to help deliver those resources and bridge the gap between education and industry. So with all of these things, um, the JCP is more open than it was before, but we continue to believe that working together with the Java developer community, we can achieve more. So that means that if you wanna participate as an individual, that's great, but working together as part of a team, either through um, people within your Java user group or um, a small collection of people that you work with, you can help each other, teach each other and work together to achieve more. Um, so through our Java user group membership, um, we're helping to spread the word of how people can participate around the world and drive adoption of the technology. And it really boils, boils down into five steps, five steps that I like to recommend. Um, whether you're doing this on your own as part of a small group, the first thing really to do is pick the thing that you want to participate and contribute to. So I've given you lots of different options throughout my talk. Um, but the, the main thing to decide on now is, you know, pick one thing that you want to um, start um, contributing to, whether it be um, early access builds, um, a standalone JSR, or do um, a standalone um, uh, education workshop, Java and education for younger developers. Pick one thing. Um, if you're looking for the, a JSR reference on jcp.org, every JSR has a project page and every project page has links to drafts as well as the public discussion list and the issue tracker and well, as well as contact information for the lead of that project. And if you're downloading early access builds, like I talked about, you can download the early access builds and there's places where you can go to give your feedback. Um, the early access build page would look like this. Um, it will give you issues and changes addressed since the last build, as well as a variety of options for your download based on your operating system. 
We also have in, within OpenJDK a quality outreach group, which is a collection of free and open source projects that are dependent on the JDK. So if you go to the quality outreach group in OpenJDK, you, you might find a project here that you might wanna participate in and contribute to that would um, be a great starter project if you haven't participated in open source projects before. But whatever the case, pick your project and then communicate about it. Um, reach out to the leader, communicate on the issue tracker or the discussion forum and talk about the steps that you wanna take. So that's the third step, Take decide on the action and actually take the action. So whatever you decide on, um, work together and communicate about it and then follow up um, with actually providing your feedback either on the issue tracker or in the discussion forum. And the last step that I wanna highlight is um, have fun while you're doing it. So whatever you decide to do, don't be limited by any of the things that I talked about. These are really the best practices that I share with you of how you can participate in workshops and have fun while building your network and building your skills as a Java developer. Whatever you decide to do, I hope that you're motivated to participate and get more involved in the Java community. And these links that I'm sharing here on my screen will help you to get further along. If you wanna follow up with me, the best way to reach me is on Twitter. I'm at Heather BC on Twitter. And I know we're going to have a chat um, where you can ask me questions. Um, but I'm finished with my presentation and just about perfectly on time. So thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed my, my uh, presentation and look forward to seeing you in the chat.